Welcome to the screencast edition on the Java SE Embedded Hard FP ABI support. I'm Roger Brinkley. In this edition of the screencast, we will actually be covering the new support for Hard Floating Point ABI, which has come in 7U40. But before we do that, let's turn first and let's take a look at a Java SE Embedded overview. So, you know, it really is when we're talking about Java SE Embedded, what is it? So Java SE Embedded is, is really the Java Standard Edition implementation optimized for embedded devices. We're talking about a reduced static footprint somewhere around the neighborhood of 60% smaller than a standard JRE. For instance, if you're looking at an x86 Linux environment of, of uh, Java SE 7U6, we're talking about 42 megabytes instead of 140 megabytes. Additionally, there's reduced memory requirements that occur here. So for on a headless system, we're talking about 32 megabytes uh, in a head full environment, 64 megabytes that are required for the memory to be able to execute in this environment. And you can configure this in either a headless or a head full configuration. The architectures that are supported, the hardware which is supported are the ARM processors, the PowerPC processors, and the x86. The key part is, is this is a fully Java SE compatible system. And finally, it's free for development, uh, but uh, there's a commercial license which is required for deployment. Now let's take a look at the Java SE embedded shipping products or the products that are shipping currently in the uh, before today, the previously supported platforms and releases. And as you can see here, there's the ARM v6 uh, and v7. You can either have it in a headful or a headless state. In both cases, those are using the vector floating point, which came into existence during the uh, kind of the ARM v6 and v7 time period. The ARM v5 is actually using the uh, VFP as well, but it's using the soft FP uh, environment. Now, actually, when we're talking about all of the ARM processors, those are all using the soft uh, FP ABIs. Also, additionally, there's implementations that are for the Power PCs and for the x86 environments. So why all this hard FP ABI fuss? If you go back in history and you look at things uh, from a historical point of view, you find out that uh, on the embedded systems, a lot of them had no floating point units. So when we're looking at the standard ARM v5 chips, there really didn't exist a floating point unit. Um, there wasn't the uh, otherwise known as the, uh, the vector floating point. When it comes up to ARM v6 and v7, that's where VFP started to come in. And, and floating point units were added to the hardware, to some of the hardware in, in, in this point. So that's where VFP started to come in so that you could start using this and either uh, they created something called the soft float. Now, a variety of the OS and the tool change and native apps uh, were supporting uh, soft float ABI. Now, soft float was good because you could run this on ARM-based systems that either had VFP or didn't have VFP. And that made it kind of convenient from that particular point of view. Eventually, Linux platforms started to come in and, and they started to support the hard FP API. Now what this meant was that they're actually going to use the FPU registers all the time. In order to do that, you have to have a system that is going to have VFP on it. And so that's why only the systems that have that will be able to run uh, these Linux platforms and the tool chains that are supporting the hard FP API. And then the last piece was why it's such a fuss is as more and more of this started to come together, well, the developers were requesting hard floating point API support. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't a lot of support that we had for floating point vectors. Uh, if you look at the difference between soft floating point and hard, hard floating point ABI, the first thing to notice is that the CPUs actually support a floating point instructions. And it doesn't matter which one of the API, ABIs that you're going to use there, it, it does happen that. Now, floating point arguments are passed native to native. On the soft floating point API, they're passed on the stack. And what that means is we have to do some conversions that occur to go to the floating point unit registers. Whereas on the hard floating point API, they're just passed on the FPU registers. The part that's interesting here and why Java actually performs better than a native application uh, if you're running on soft FP API is because when you're, when you're talking about 
passing floating point in instructions between Java methods, then it is used on the floating point registers. The other part is, is that when you're converting between a, a Java virtual machine and a native, then obviously on soft FP API, it's going to go on the stack, just like it was if it was a native to native environment. But on the hard FP API, you're going to go to the, to the FPU registers. What this means is that when it comes to floating point intensive apps, such as games and graphics, it's going to be a little bit slower than it is on, on the soft API, than it, and it's going to be much faster in a, on a hard FP API. So what's the announcement that's come out today? Well, Java SE Embedded SU40 now has full support for hard FP API for the ARM platform for version 6 and version 7. And the fact is, if you look at the download page, you're going to see this page exactly the way it exists right here. And you'll see these are the Java Oracle Java SE Embedded version 7 update 40. And you notice here the first three entries are for ARM 6 and 7, and the last one is for ARM 7. Now this is for a headless or a headful environment, or the other one is for the ARM 7 is for the, for the server environment. In all cases, it will use the hard FP ABI. A question you may be asking yourself is, well, okay, but what if I'm sitting on a system that has a soft API that's ARM, ARM 6 and ARM 7? And we still support that. Those are still there. There's still a va valid download that you can get. As you can see here, uh, same set, headless client, headful client, headless server, or ARM v5 as well. So the key part there is know what the underlying platform the supports or the underlying hardware supports when you're going to download the Oracle Java SE embedded um, software. And of course, we also support the still support the PowerPC and the x86 architecture. Well, what will all this mean for developers? Well, first and foremost, this is the first officially supported Java SE embedded release with hard FP ABI support. Now, this will run on ARM v7 as well as ARM v6. That's important because one of the more popular ARM v6s that is out there right now is a Raspberry Pi. You have the ability to have the hard FP support for the Raspberry Pi now. Now, there have been other... Uh, test environments or evaluation environments for Java SE 8 that supported hard floating point API. But this is the first officially supported Java SE embedded release that you can use on the ARM v7s and ARM v6 that have the floating point support. Secondly, you're going to see a lot more OEM usage. So if you're, you, if you're writing code that goes on to an OEM platform and that OEM platform starts to convert over to the hard float ABI, then you're going to be able to leverage that. And we should be able to see some speed increases. Our Java benchmark speed increases that we're seeing are around 5 to 8% improvements. Now, remember, we talked about this, but that's actually less than what native apps are going to get. Um, and that's the reason for that is because we're already doing some floating within a Java application. We're already doing floating point to floating point conversions. So a native app doesn't have that advantage. It's, it's going off to the registers, and then it's, it has to do the transfer to the floating point unit once it gets there. Of course, results are application specific, and, uh, and they will vary based upon how much code you're actually doing in, in floating point. The big key in all of this is that you don't have to do any code change. There is one exception to that, and that is if you're passing any code to native code, you may have to make some changes in your native code to be able to run on hard FP. And that means that you're going to have to conditionally compile because if you're still uh, running any of this code on a soft FP uh, environments or hardware, you're going to have to be able to have the option of being able to do one or the other or to be able to optionally compile one or the other. Now, here are some of the popular ARM embedded systems for developers. The one on the left is the Raspberry Pi. A very small type of processor, about the size of a credit card. Cost is about $35 plus whatever you would charge for a power cord. The uh, one on the left, or the one on the right, is a Freescale environment, the IMX 6Q. Uh, certainly much more processing power as it has a 1 gigahertz quad-core ARM Cortex-A9 processor and 1 gigabyte of RAM, which is built into it. So you've got a great deal more flexibility in this. 
you know, your mileage is going to vary. It depends on where you want to put these and, and what environment you're really trying to put these in as to what will guide what you want to use. But either one of these platforms will support the hard FP. Both of them have the hard FP into the software, and they will support the new releases that we had for hard FP in Java SE Embedded. Here's some resources that you'll be interested in when it comes to uh, looking up more information about this, Java SE Embedded Home where you can find the downloads, the various system requires for Java SE Embedded. And then there's the Java SE Embedded Community. Actually, it's the Java Embedded Community as a whole. It covers both ME and SE, and you can find a variety of information if you're working on embedded platforms. And then finally, there's a, uh, a new uh, website that we have out called the Oracle Internet of Things platform. This will give you a great cross-section between the ME platform and the SE platform. Thanks for listening to this screencast, and remember, make the future Java.